Good evening. My name is Erin Vincent and I am the CEO of the Wheeler Centre. I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place. I'd also like to acknowledge any First Nations people with us today and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge the First Peoples of Australia as the first storytellers and creators of culture. Their stories have impacted and influenced all of us here today. Thank you so much for coming out on this beautiful Melbourne day for another fabulous Spring Fling event. Spring Fling is a short series of big ideas presented by the Wheeler Centre. It features over 60 inspiring writers and runs over 12 days in and around Melbourne. This year, we are bringing together an outstanding list of thinkers who have all gone above and beyond in their own different ways. Spring Fling is proudly supported by the Victorian Government through Creative Victoria and through the Melbourne City Revitalisation Fund. And special thanks to our official bookseller, Readings, and our accommodation partner, the Sofitel, for their support tonight. These events would not be possible without the generous support of our partners. You are all in for a wonderful evening with the incredibly talented Pia Miranda tonight. Pia is one of Australia's most loved and critically acclaimed actors. Her breakout role was in a film that will always have a special place in so many of our hearts, Looking for Ali Brandy. It's a story that spoke to me. I was a teenager at the time, also from a loud and loving European family, and Josie was more than a character to me. She mirrored many of my experiences. But the amazing thing about this story was that it spoke to anyone searching for acceptance, searching for love, anyone who has challenged tradition or conquered fear. Of course, Pia has gone on to be known for an impressive body of work starring in Heat, Grassroots, The Secret Life of Us, Sea Patrol, Mustangs FC and the acclaimed Foxtel drama Wentworth. She's also competed in Dancing with the Stars and was crowned the winner of one of uh, the most watched TV series in Australian history, Survivor. And tonight, she's here to talk about her first book and memoir, Finding My Bella Vita, a story that reminds us never to be defined by what was before in the quest for a beautiful life. Tonight's discussion will be hosted by Jacqueline Krupe. Jacqueline is a book editor, project manager and bookseller who has worked in publishing and bookselling for more than 20 years. Jacqueline has written a number of award-winning books for children and adults, including Garden Like a Nonno and the ABC Kids Guide to Loving the Planet. Jacqueline's new book, Pastor Love, which sounds amazing, is available for sale up the back along with Piers, came out last week and I'm now going to hand over to Jacqueline to get tonight underway. Have a wonderful night. So Italian, we just plant our wine. <laughs> Getting ready. <laughs> Got to have, have the wine. We're good. <laughs> Got to have the vino. <laughs> Welcome everyone to this in conversation event with Pia Miranda. My name is Jacqueline Krupe, and I am that bookseller, book editor, just generally bookish person. Um, so I've written two books about my nonni, Nonna Knows Best and Garden Like a Nonno, which showcasing what they taught me about food and life and growing vegetables. As Kate said, my most recent book is Pasta Love. It's a love letter to pasta and the people who make it. So I think you can see why they may have thought I would be a good person to host this conversation tonight. But I do still feel the need to give you my Looking for Ala Brandi credentials. So I was in year seven when the book came out and a librarian at my Catholic girls' school pressed it into my hands. And she said, you're going to like this book. That book changed my life. It's a cliche to say that, but it's absolutely true. I had never before seen myself in the pages of a book and I had been a voracious reader from a young age. Today, I work in publishing and I write books because of that book. 
I've been lucky enough to tell Melina Marquetta that several times, the author of that book. Pia Miranda didn't actually write the book. She does, she does sometimes so take much credit cre- for it. Yeah, I've heard. the whole, I've been on this book tour and people are like, thank you so much for, for looking for Ella Brandy. I loved your book. And I'm like, no problem. <laughs> so good, so good. But Melina may well wish that I shut up about it because I do say it all the time. So for the film, I was in my 20s when it came out and it too had a profound effect. I recently rewatched it and it totally holds up. I'm really delighted to be in conversation with Pia Miranda to celebrate the publication of her delightful book, Finding My Bella Vita. Pia is happy to sign copies of her book at the end of the event. And I'll just start, we're gonna talk through it and it's gonna be beautiful, but I just found it so achingly relatable. And are you ready to go? Okay, let's, let's do, it. do this. So oh, you start the book in Sicily. Well. <laughs> Oh, shit. Ooh. I said, did you, last night I broke the microphone. Tighten that thing, maybe? The round thing? We might need oh, look, some... No, I did. Yeah. Okay, just don't move. Okay, we won't move. So you start the book in Sicily and you introduce us to your nonna as a young woman. She's loving her village life, despite there not really being many opportunities for education or work. But she thinks in that, in that moment that she's never going to leave the island. But life and fate and God have other ideas. Can you tell us a bit about your nonna Angelina and her village? Well, it was such a bizarre thing that when I went to write this book, I remembered that I'd sat down with her when I was about 18 years old and written my, um, like my final year 12 massive essay on her life. And I thought, if I can find this essay, maybe it's a sign that that's how I should start it because Mm -hmm. I was really struggling to start. because I don't know <laughs> when you write an autobiography you can feel quite conceited when you start the book it's really yeah. it's just very stressful so I found this and it just it reminded me of what a strong person she was because I think my memories of her are always just about love and how to love big so mm. I think the thing I learned most from her was to love huge but when I read that story back as an adult I think when I was young I was just like writing this story about how hard and difficult and Mm. sometimes tragic her life had been I didn't really take it on board and now that I'm a mother I appreciated her her positive attitude more than ever because I never saw any of that pain in her day to day Mm. and she always said any day above the earth is a good day yeah it's a classic Italian (laughs) saying you're alive you're alive it's also like a little bit stop complaining exactly (laughs) exactly um so then along comes nonno salvatore and you're able to recount so beautifully their courtship and the war years. And I wondered, is it through that essay that you got those stories? Because I know you never actually got to meet your nonno. It is through that essay, but I definitely did. I write a little um, a note at the end that I do embellish some of the, what I thought happened as far as what she was going through emotionally. Like right. That's my interpretation of it, just to colour it and give it, I wanted to give that um, a beautiful life, that chapter. I really wanted to, oh, it's name of my book. <laughs> um, I wanted to, to have it be almost reflective of an old Italian film. That's, it's so cinematic. It <laughs> really you. is. So um, I definitely put some of that stuff in, but I did not know him. I didn't know much about him really. I'd have only ever seen a few photos of him and she didn't really talk about him that much. Yeah, it's interesting. So um, I got to know my – I was lucky enough to know both all my grandparents, but they never talked about that period, mm-hmm. that war period. You know, Italy's role in the war was incredibly complicated and, of course, they switched sides, which the shame of that and having, you know, fought for a fascist and my nonno became a prisoner of war during the war right. and he never talked about it. I couldn't write that chapter because he just would never talk about it. Right. So I loved that you got to have that and, sure, with a little bit of embellishment. But yeah. You know, that's life. But, um, but the drama, I mean, yeah. it's quite action-packed and, and all really, of that was real 100 yeah. that's i mean unless she lied but no she didn't um all of that <laughs> was real don't lie no they don't they're lie. real stories yeah. and i found that so i really i stayed true to the facts i just tried yeah. to color it to make it human and to make it to give it a beautiful story and, yeah. and beautiful and vision. look they know tragedy don't they like it's not, yeah. not they did not have an easy life no um so i often talk about how writing about my nonni and pasta and gardening and all of it is a way to keep them 
close to me Mm -hmm. and with me, even though they're not with me anymore. Did you find that writing about your your nonni? Yeah, I found it exciting in the sense that I thought, wow, she would never have known that she's in a book. You know, I think that was part of it. That I just went, because she's like, loved attention. She's Italian, you know. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Let's be real. Um, and so that part of it, I felt more excited than anything. I just yeah. thought, isn't this amazing that she gets to be in this book and this woman who, you know, I reflect on often. I reflect on my grandparents quite a lot. I mean, mm. both my grandparents were incredible. And so to put them in a book, I just felt... I found that part of writing the book super exciting. Yeah, and I want to come back to that and just writing about them without them here and what that's like. But I don't want to overstate your Italian ancestry too much, though I likely will just because I share it. And like Um, because I'm dressed like I'm going to a funeral. I don't know, it was the last night of my book tour and I've been wearing jeans every night. I'm like, I'm going to go full... But I think it's also that you will forever be Josie Alibrandi for many of us. Mm -hmm. Um, And we'll talk about that a lot later. But your maternal grandparents were also a huge part of your upbringing. Yeah. Um, You write about them so beautifully in the book. And in the moment, I'm going to get you to read us a section about them. But can you just tell us a bit about them? They were, you know, I think I was lucky to be very blessed with both sides of my uh, family. I just having a really, oh my God, what is wrong with me? It's having a really great relationship with the, both of my grandparents. Mm. And the thing that they taught me was that it was all love, all acceptance, all fun. Um, and so, you know, they were very different worlds. And I actually don't really remember them like cross pollinating very yeah. much, even though they seem to have a very um, a sort of a joint respect for each other. But, you know, my nonna's house was filled with just such Italianness, And then my nana's house, my, my you know, um, she had, it was so Australian and the food was really different. But the feeling that I had in both those places was exactly the same. That's yeah, beautiful. it was really yeah. just, and, you know, even now I just sort of see little things that remind me of my nan or if I make anyone lemon slice, you know, anyone in my family goes a little nuts when the lemon slice comes out. And it's her recipe. Yeah, yeah, because I think it reminds us of just that time that we felt safe and loved and happy and she had this – she lived on a big old dairy and for myself and my cousins it was just – it was a really magical place and a place that we always kind of just went to when we needed somewhere to, you know, have a break. Yeah, yeah. gorgeous. Are you happy to give a reading yeah, sure. from I've got no section? glasses on so apologies in advance for any nonsense that comes out of my mouth. <clears throat> My childhood was an all dabbling in in exorcisms followed by excellent Italian food. (laughs) The other half of my family was as Aussie as they come. I had Nana and Grandfather, of course, and my mum's sister was pure country. She lived in the remote town of Charlton between Melbourne and Mildura with her six kids who were all awesome. Visits to their place were always filled with adventure. My cousins would rough and tumble with me and my auntie would let us wander around like free-range chickens and have as much fun as we (laughs) liked. It was pure joy. One visit in the middle of a terrible mouse plague... Yikes. I don't think my auntie's read this bit yet. (laughs) And the adults put me to bed on a mattress on the floor encircled by mouse traps, and told me that if I needed to go to the toilet, I should probably wait until morning. (laughs) Good night, love. (laughs) All I heard once the lights went out was snap, snap, snap. A bit gruesome, but it was good training for a future Survivor player. (laughs) I loved my early years in Melbourne, pinballing between my very Italian side and my very Australian side. In true Gemini style, I often felt split down the middle, but it was a feeling that I cherished, even though it left me a little bit confused. I I consider one major lucky break in my life was the blessing of amazing grandparents. I inherited my nonna's passion for food and mystery, and I like to think her resilience. And if I have a flair for fashion, it definitely comes from my nana, who knew how to put together a twin set and did her hair in rollers every morning so that she always looked like an old movie star. Sorry, my eyes are going. An old, like an old movie star. I inherited a passion for neatness and cleaning from Nana too. She loved a freshly vacuumed carpet and the smell of Mr. Sheen. Both <laughs> things that still give me great joy. She was so organised that when my cousin Anthony came down from the country to live with her, she would religiously dust and neaten his massive stack of chronologically displayed penthouse magazines <laughs> that lined the wall of his room. No questions asked. As long as they weren't dusty then they couldn't offend anyone (laughs) my grandfather was great fun and when I was at his and his nana's place 
I would spend a lot of time with him watching our beloved Bloods play AFL. Like all true Bloods fans, when South Melbourne Football Club became the Sydney Swans, my family stayed loyal. Grandfather tried to get me into cricket too, but it bored me senseless. It bored me senseless. He occasionally would sneak me swigs of his Melbourne bitter long neck while we cheered the bloods on, which probably gave me a predilection for alcohol at a way too younger age, but it was the 80s and that's how things were back then. <laughs> Grandfather would occasionally take me to an AFL game, and I guess that's how I fell in love with football. We would sit in the stands together, me munching on a pie while he drank a beer, and get completely raucous, screaming and yelling when we kicked a goal. During every football outing, he'd share with me the secret that he was friends with the umpire and told them that his granddaughter was coming to the game that day. So they'd agreed to help us win. So whenever the Swans were awarded a free kick, he would say, did you see that umpire wink at us? That free kick was for you. And I'd sit up straight in my chair, completely chuffed and full of pride, knowing that I was the secret ingredient for a Swans victory. Yes. I actually believed this story until my early 20s, which in hindsight <laughs> seems really naive, but I loved those times so much and I didn't want to let go of the magic. Around this time, I began to develop health anxieties. The fact that Quincy M.E. was my favourite TV show probably didn't help. Quincy was a great show starring Jack Klugman as a medical examiner who helped the LAPD investigate mysterious deaths. <laughs> Mum and I loved it. We would <laughs> snuggle up on the couch with some Milo and ice cream and watch it together. But I was harbouring a secret. I would study those mysterious deaths and then add them to my Rolodex in my brain of possible disasters that may befall me. I'd run into my bedroom during the commercial breaks just to test that my heart was still beating. And if I couldn't find the pulse, then a jolt of fear would burst through my body and then, luckily, this would cause my heartbeat to go into overdrive and panicked but relieved, I'd inevitably be able to locate it and then return to the couch, satisfied that I would live to see another day. Yes. <laughs> sorry, I had no glasses on, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you so much. So I want to talk about the humour in the book later because that shows just how funny Pia is, and so we'll get to that. So on a more serious note, though, a lot of ethical issues can come up when you're writing a memoir, mm -hmm. um, when you're the one with the platform to tell yeah. other people's stories. Um, I recently grappled with this and just felt a huge sense of responsibility and pressure to the people whose stories I was telling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I had their permission to tell those stories. I was never able to get my nonnies permission like you, as when they were alive, I never thought I would be writing about them. It never occurred to me yeah. that I would write about them which is so silly now. Of course, I was always going to write about it. <laughs> so in your acknowledgements, and you've said before that Nonna Angelina would have loved all this fuss, and I'm sure that she would have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but did you encounter any sort of ethical stumbling blocks when telling this story that's very much your life, but that of course includes family, friends, colleagues, there's other people? Yeah, I pretty much sent it to everyone who was mentioned. So mm. I, I, or I very much left no stone unturned. I mean, obviously my auntie didn't know about the mouse, but I knew she would laugh about it. Little things like that, yeah, I knew sure. they'd laugh about it. Even little snippets from my school friends, I'd check. Right. Um, there are some people, uh, like there's a story about my friend who was Gay Davidson's daughter. Mm. Gay Davidson's not alive anymore. I sought out her, a family member, her sister, got her to read it. Um, right. Because I just didn't want anyone, I didn't want there to be a bad taste about it because it yeah. is a book about hope and love and joy. Of course. And so, yeah, I think... Um, it was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot, but I, I didn't include anyone who wasn't okay with it. Okay, yeah. I think that's important. I think, yeah, doing that makes yeah. you feel okay. I think. Yeah, and, and then I also, tricky. on top of it, I got Carly Finlay to do a, um, yeah. a sensitivity read for me yeah. because I was dealing with – it was discussing some issues like, you know, disability and and um, and um, – visual differences but I it wasn't something that I'm living with every day mm. so I just wanted to make sure that the language is really important now so I just wanted to make sure that I could feel confident that the language is important and all of her notes were actually really great yeah I actually have a question about something she said to you later as well um so to Ala Brandi, the film, you had what sounds like an incredibly supportive shoot. It just mm -hmm. sounds like utopia, right? Yeah. So the director, Kate Woods, the writer, Melina Marchetta, they just seemed to create this really idyllic working environment. You had your friend, Kit Gurry, in the film with you. Uh, it was your first big film mm -hmm. experience. And I wondered, how did having such a positive experience help or hinder 
future experiences that may not have been so positive. I know it was shit because right. like my biggest, <laughs> like my first thing was like the best, like the most amazing experience, and then everything else is just kind of in a pale in comparison. Yeah, I mean, I've done some beautiful job since then but for a couple of years after I'm like oh okay like it's not it's right. not all the most amazing experience of your life so it's it's a lot when your first big job is you know one of the most successful things you're going to do but yeah. then um but then to be honest like most most sets probably I think I've worked on like maybe one or two that I haven't enjoyed most sets are a big sort of family and you all do kind of fall in love and create this new vibe in Australia it's just yeah it's just a really it is pretty good you know I definitely romanticized that because we were so passionate and it was Mm. we knew it was such a big thing but it's very rare that I don't get sad when a job ends yeah Yeah. that's good that's good to know yeah Um, so Josie Brandi looms large in your life um, I'm being dramatic, but I'm Italian, so I can be. <laughs> but she's been sort of both a blessing and a curse. Yeah. Um, but she does get you free mortadella and prosciutto in Italian delis, totally. which is nothing to be sneezed at. <laughs> um, but there is also a period of your life where you have all these, you're getting recognised and people are offering you, offering you all this ad- free advice mm-hmm. about what you should do with your career. And in the book, you do have a bit of a reckoning with Josie um, and you write... The irony of losing my identity after making a film about a girl searching for hers is not lost on me. <laughs> Can you reflect on this character and tell us about the role that she's played in your life? It's, it's a, a huge question. Yeah, it's a funny thing because um, so she means so much to so many people and I think because Kik and I, we had skipped it at school so we didn't realise what a big deal it was going to be. And then when it it happened, we were all sort of caught up in like, this is exciting, <laughs> you know, we're going to parties and people are, you know, we're getting to do auditions that we wouldn't have been able to do beforehand. And as it dragged on and, and I started going like, I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent, It's I started to feel those pangs of anxiety and probably a little bit of resentment. Yeah. Um, and then I just, it felt like it was probably a year afterwards and then I felt like, I just could see myself, I thought there were two paths I could go down. I could go down the path of being like, you know, fuck, this is so annoying. And then I thought that's just so ridiculous. I need to go down the path of the fact that I can make someone's day every day of my life is such an incredible gift just by going, I know it's amazing and being happy and loving it. So I just made a really conscious decision to embrace it, to be grateful and that I think has served me really well because – um. You know, you, if you can make someone happy and pretend that you know what tomato day is, <laughs> that's that's a really – that's a joy. Like a lot of actors don't get to do that once in their life. Yeah. So um, so there, there was a moment – I don't want to sound ungrateful, but there was a moment. And it probably was because the experience was – I was experiencing, you know, the joys of being Josie, but also I was really struggling f- mm. to um, – pay my bills day to day Mm. and then I felt like my ability to go and get a job in a pub or a shop had been taken away I know I could have done that but it was just that that stuff I grappled with so once I made that decision to just love Josie and love the experience everything's been easier and I think Melina probably I don't want to speak for Melina Mm. but we're so close Melina probably has a similar experience Mm. in that you just you, you have to embrace that because we are lucky yeah and the alternative is not great either, no. right? Yeah, resenting and, it. Yeah, and yeah. then, you know, I just think, I just think, well, that's sort of, that's sad for other people too who love it so much. Mm. And so now, you know, it's beautiful. And, and Melina and I a few years ago um, did a, a, Marie Cardi does those things where you get up on stage and you write a letter to each other. Yeah. And we wrote a, I wrote a letter to her and she wrote a letter to me and we performed it. And something in that moment we were healed because we realised we'd had the same experience but we'd been living these separate lives and so that brought us back together and us coming back together, you know, 10 years ago has been a beautiful healing and wonderful experience because all we do now is celebrate it. Yeah, that's so gorgeous. Oh, I love that. Okay. At one point in the book, though, you speculate <laughs> about what your life might have been like if you never played Josie mm-hmm. Brandi. And it's not something you'll ever know, of course, but I did wonder, what does the idea of someone, someone else getting to play her, like if it wasn't you and it had been someone else? Well, I'm Sicilian, so I would have had to kill her. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually the answer no, I was happen. for. Yes, death. death uh, yeah, it'd yeah. be weird deaths yeah. <laughs> yeah. young actresses who yeah. were going to play Josie until they got to me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I guess... Um, 
I don't know, actually. I don't know. You know what? I never expected that I was going to get it. So mm. I think it would it would have been fine if I'd gone to that audition and they'd sent me home early. I'd be like, well, it wasn't meant to be. But if I'd gotten so close and then it got taken away, yeah. I think that would have broken my heart. Your, your description of the um, the casting experience is really, <laughs> so gosh, it's just, it's so stressful as yeah. a reader. You're like, and, and we know that you, we know you get it. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, this is horrible what they put you through. Yeah. Um, and Melina not being allowed to smile when you walk in. Yeah. And she's such a smiley, loving person. That must have been so hard for her. It was hard for her because I gave her the big smile and she just looked at me like this because <laughs> they told that, um, they told Melina and the director not to smile at anyone, not to get people's hopes up, which I get, but it was really off-putting. Yeah. <laughs> and you're in just a room full of people who look exactly like you. Yeah. And, so yeah. usually, you know, usually when you I would go to an audition, I might be sort of, I might be the Italian, there might be a Greek. And right. then, you know, most people sort of, you know, it, there's not usually a whole room of oh, Italians. It was, And it was really weird it's kind of like when I go to Italy and I look around I'm like oh god I'm not even one of the good ones like you know what I mean in Australia I'm kind of like I'm kind of cute and then I go to Italy I'm like oh no I'm like subpar at best um so it was sort of that experience as well I'm like Jesus oh I love that so talk a bit more about identity you know figuring out our identity especially when multiple cultures are involved Mm -hmm. it's not an uncommon story but I think when you're the one going through it you feel you're the only only person in the world having this yeah. experience but you know it's books and films and art that sort of show us that some of these things are quite universal um, I give a lot of talks that include talking about growing up Italian Australian and it's really amazing to me how many people of different cultures come up to me and tell me how much they relate um, and all different cultures and I'm sure you're going to find the same with this book um, But so after all this grappling with identity that you've done for the book and the process of writing it and all that reflection, what is your takeaway about your identity? My takeaway about my identity is that it's a lot easier. I mean, I had that 50th birthday. I think it's a really nice time to write a book. Um, so, you know, I, you can, I sort of weirdly am looking at life, just assuming I'm a little, I'm a hundred, but it's, it feels like a halfway point, I guess, because yeah. it's a half a century and writing that book, I think sometimes like everyone that we're really hard on our mistakes and hard on the things, that, the wrong choices we've made or the stupid shit we've done. And it was easier for me to not look backwards anymore. And then mm. to go, wow, well, who do I want to be looking forwards? Mm. And then I was almost able as an outsider to look at my life as like a two-act play. And I'm like, well, I know the second act in the play is always the best one. So it almost took a little bit of a fear of turning 50 and getting older away and let me sort of look forward to like, what am I going to do next? Yeah, which is I nice. love that. That's such yeah. a beautiful process. Because I mean, writing a book can be so difficult. Yeah. And it sounds like you've sort of made it this really positive thing for the future. Yeah, because when you, especially when I was doing the audio book, which mm. honestly, <laughs> stabbed myself in the eye, like it was the worst <laughs> experience. But, um, you know, it was like, <laughs> you do feel like you're reading someone else's life. And right. it's so easy to be so forgiving to this person. You're like, well, that wasn't that bad. I mean, I let, I Look, anyone knows me well, I did leave out a couple of big mistakes I made, but, you know, those men don't that's need to know prerogative. about it. Yeah, <laughs> that's your prerogative. The, the, those moments don't deserve the book. Yeah, but, um, you know, that was really a good feeling because you it feels – I feel like we don't talk enough about shame and embarrassment mm. and I have suffered from that a lot, just mm. even just shame of just not being one of – I think people – think I should be or you know all that Mm. stuff I think we all carry that around and then when you write it down and you read it you think well there's really nothing to be embarrassed about because we're all just kind of flawed and doing our best yeah well so you think you were kinder to yourself doing the audio process oh like not like (laughs) (laughs) uh reading it yeah yeah. I think so yeah Yeah. even though I was panicking about sounding like a ferret I was um (laughs) I was kinder to myself I was like this is a story about a person just who's not perfect but who's Mm. just trying to find their way which is all our stories right yeah yeah oh I love that okay so there's a moment in the book where the film takes you Melina and Kate to Italy you're attending a glamorous film festival you meet a young man in the industry he drives you around Rome on the back of his Vespa he takes you to his favorite restaurants he introduces you to his friends. It's all. It's also romantic and cinematic again, sort yeah, of like the was. beginning of the book. 
But something much more sinister is playing out and you are completely understandably oblivious to Mm -hmm. it. So when I read that he had organised for you to travel by private jet with Harvey Weinstein, my breath caught because that's a story we now know well. We Mm -hmm. know what happens in that story. A very special person stopped you from getting on that plane. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about her? Yeah, Greta Skaki, who played my mother in Looking for Ala Brundi. Um, I had this, we had been in Italy for quite a while doing this whirlwind tour of um, film festivals. And when you do film festivals, you know, you're surrounded by other people who love film as much as you. Mm. And it's really common to just meet new people and people from film companies will host you at dinners or you'll make new friends. And I did meet a guy and, you know, it was lovely and sweet. It was a really innocent little romance. And then he ended up um, being friends with Harvey and his friends and then it, everything started to change and um, I started hanging out with them a lot and you know the thing about m- predators or men like that is that they're I think that when we hear about them we think they come with like you know black coats and fangs mm. but they're lovely mm. I mean <laughs> lovely like lovely lovely charming funny sweet telling you nice things not being too inappropriate mm. um, and so when the time came for me, it started, everything started to change and the time came where the – I said his name. Jeez, I don't get sued. Um, when he had started to really push me and Harvey together and then I thought – that they Harvey offered to take me on the, his plane and it was – and then I found out it was just going to be him and I on the mm. plane and no one else, which kind of weirded me out but I thought maybe it's like a meeting because I'd seen pictures of other movie stars on this plane mm. and I went, oh, that sounds nice. Like maybe it's a meeting – um, and Greta was the one who was really adamant. And because my phone was ringing off the hook, she doesn't remember this, but she actually I took it off the hook. And then she went and rang the film festival and made me get in a car and said, it's something bad will happen to you on that plane. And she was holding the other guy's um, business card and saying, this isn't a real business card. It's not real. None of this is real. Right. But I think the weirdest thing about that situation I didn't want to write it. I kind of did want to write it because I love that story of her mm. knowing more than I knew mm. and having more of a life and then and then using her knowledge about how the world works to save me basically. Yeah. Yeah. But I also I love the idea of sisterhood in that moment. But I also think that it was just a really interesting story about how I didn't know anything bad had happened. Mm. I still thought she was being weird. I was mm. like, oh, she's being so full on. And then it wasn't until years later that my husband showed me the article about his friend and that's that was the modus operandi for mm. all the young ladies who mm. had something bad happen to them. Yeah. And as the reader, we sort of, again, we have knowledge that you don't have in that moment too, but it's completely understandable you not having that knowledge. You know, you're a young yeah, actress, yeah, in, yeah. you know, in Rome and yeah. seeing the world and it's all so exciting. And strangers often, they will host you, they'll take you places, mm. they'll say, you know what, we'll pick you up, we'll take you to this thing. Mm. You you will audition in hotel rooms. Yeah. That's not uncommon and it's yeah. never been, for me, a weird experience. Mm. It's been actually an audition, they just will hire a mm. hotel room. So there's lots, and your alarm bells aren't out because you just think, this is a beautiful industry and they make beautiful movies and I want to be part of it. Yeah, I think it it, it shows just how vulnerable you are in this whole world that you're moving in. And I deliberately framed the question about being Mm -hmm. about Greta because she's the hero of the story. Yeah, I sent that to her. Yeah. She's like, I don't don't remember that. (laughs) Did I? It sounds very full on. I'm like, no, it's actually you are way more full on and I've toned it down for the book. I pulled the phone out of the wall. Did I? Anyway, she, yeah. Should I do sort now that you mention it? Yeah. I do. We were drinking right. a lot of champagne, weren't we? Yeah. <laughs> yes, we were. <laughs> so another powerful man in the book who I would like to bring down is the casting agent who tells you that you aren't funny. Mm-hmm. I've read your book and Fuck you're hilarious. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. It's hard to be funny on the page. So I want to know how you found your voice. And the humour writing in the, in this book. Um, thank you. That's such oh, a nice compliment. You're hilarious. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I know this sounds really strange, but I've I've I'm really obsessed with comic timing. It's yeah. just one of my, it's like one of my nerdy little things, and I watch a lot of stand up. Right. And so um, when I was writing it, I was saying the sentences out aloud to work out timing. So I'm um, mm. thank you because I'm, oh. I'm I wasn't sure. Sometimes like does that sound weird. But um, I, that was one thing that I was almost a bit mathematical about is just how the rhythm of the gags might work and I think it probably comes from years of obsessively thinking about 
comedy and timing and that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah. and just because I'm, I mean, everyone loves someone who's just self-deprecating. So I thought, well, if people are going to like that, yeah, <laughs> you know, <it's>, surely. <laughs> but it's it's a perfect <laughs> self-deprecating sort of light touch. Thank you. I think you can be some some um, memoirists they go too far mm-hmm. and they just tear themselves asunder. It's like, yeah. on, like <laughs> we still need to like you. Like. <laughs> yeah, that's a hard bit. Like you know, I think that because. I think like everyone you grapple with, I really want people to like me. Yeah. But then it was really – I had to be really strict with myself to go write the book truthfully. Don't write the book because you're trying to change people's opinions of you mm. or have people like you because then it's not going to be authentic. Mm. So that was – sometimes I would actually change things. I'm like, no – I took stuff out. I'm like, no, I'm writing that because I want people to think yeah. this. And then that's when the editing came in. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, being an Italian – girl growing up in the 70s and 80s like you you had to be likable right, right like that, of course we were taught that to be likable yeah. and people pleasing and all those things yes yeah. and you do have to unlearn that I think a little bit yeah. as you get older and yeah, yeah you know we talk about unlikable characters in in novels all the time and I love really unlikable women mm-hmm. in novels <laughs> <laughs> and it's it can be true in memoir too not that you're unlikable yeah. but that you can have moments where you're not the best person in the world yeah, right like absolutely. we all have those moments yeah. but um okay so for some you might embody Josie Alabrandi, but for others you will forever be the tough woman who won Survivor. <laughs> you write about that experience in, uh, and the profound impact it had on you. I was uh, surprised by how profound an impact oh. it had um, and it, that it lasted a long time mm. afterwards. How do you encapsulate that experience of Survivor? So put Josie behind you and now you're in Survivor. I mean, Survivor, look, to recover, to take a long time to recover from Survivor is not an unusual thing. Mm. So when we think about doing a show like Survivor is that you become part of a community and that community talks a lot amongst themselves. So, you know, a two-year recovery period is not normal. It's not that bad. Right. Some people don't recover. Right. Um, but the thing about Survivor is it's just it was a super nerd. I literally, you know, when I wrote that big speech, like I do know that off my heart. Like yeah. I know I am just a massive, massive Survivor fan, super nerd. My friend Tom and I were so obsessed with it when we started it and I would sit on the couch and be like, I could win that. <laughs> totally win that. And then he's like, yeah, sure. Um, and then yeah. went on and I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, you know, no, no, let me tell you, she should have done. And I'm sure everyone does that when they're watching yeah. Survivor. Um, and then I tried to apply for the American one. So I, I did not go into Survivor thinking about myself. It was refreshing. I didn't think about myself as an actress. I didn't mm. think about myself as Pia. I just went, I'm just going in to play to win. Like yeah. I was like, I will. Luke's like, it's you and me terrifying. <laughs> and then, <laughs> but then I got there and I, I was not anything like I thought I'd be. I'm just going to be ruthless. I'm going to do this. And I was like, hi, I'm Pia. And just like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on. And then, you know, the first day they tried to vote me out. And then I'm like, oh, it's okay. Guys, like it was just, I mean, <laughs> everything I didn't want to be, I was in that first episode, but I saved myself. So, yeah. Um, and then, you know, it was fun. It was just fun. I mean, some people, it, it, some people just love it in on a deep level. And mm. it's just how I love it so much. When I was lying to people's faces and then voting them out, I can't, like the joy wow. it brought me. <laughs> and pure survivor fans yeah. will say that, you know, I blindsided with one of my really good friends brutally and he was like, oh, this is one of the best moments of my life. Like that's what a real <laughs> Survivor super fan feels. Yeah. So I just, I just, I would do it sometimes. We're looking at someone go, oh my God, no way. Like I swear I'm your best friend. And then I'm like, get him out. <laughs> and then I just thought, this is so funny. You never get to do this in real life. And I love that for real fans, it's not hurtful. Like I didn't mind if people did that to me yeah, as well. Yeah. So that was the It's fun all strategy, of it. right? Yeah, like it's it a fun of it. Yeah. 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 You yeah. obviously, you were very good at it. Thank you. Well, I like <laughs> the idea that you have to, uh, be likable enough that people want to keep you around, but not so likable that people want you out. But then you have to vote people out, but brutally enough that they want to vote you to win, but you still have to have them like you enough at the end to yeah, make you want to yeah, win. So yeah. it's, it's complicated. It's a crazy it's, game. Yeah, it's good. So what did... <laughs> this is a very other side of your personality, I feel. The Gemini thing is coming out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what did Survivor and Life on the Island with so little teach you, living like that? Um... It taught me, uh, you know, you do get really deep friendships. It taught yeah. me um, we have a fire pit now in my house because I feel like when you have a fire pit outside, everyone puts their phones down and they really yeah. talk. And I felt like we just nice. talked around the fire. I did not miss my phone once in seven weeks. I made some friendships that were just so deep because mm. I would tell these people things. I'm like, oh, I haven't told anyone that because 
I don't sit with people and just talk and talk and talk for seven hours. So it taught me a lot about relationships and humanity. It taught me that I really don't fucking want to ever go camping. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. um, <laughs> like um, it just – and it taught me – I mean I, it definitely taught me that I'm more resilient than I thought. Mm. I had to do so many things out there that terrified me. I don't like mm. heights. Uh, the homesickness was horrible. I'm not like naturally brave and mm. – um, it's rare for things to scare me now right. and it's nice because you know I because I am somewhat you know I've always been young looking and I'm sort of bubbly and people have always sometimes they have been infantilized in my life mm. now and then mm. sometimes I'll be on set and I was like oh fuck with her though <laughs> you know, and I really like it <laughs> we so. saw her on Survivor, yeah. Yeah. yeah so you did struggle a little bit with the public reaction mm-hmm. and their perception of the way you played the game have you made peace with that now do you feel yeah because I didn't actually do anything like I just played yeah. really well I yeah. think it was just um sometimes there's gender and it happens to a lot of people you know a lot of women who win Survivor talk about the fact that when there's a lot of gender bias in the mm. game I think because especially as the game's gone on it's become a lot about brute strength and yeah. you know men grunting and stuff not that there's anything wrong with men grunting it's lovely <laughs> but um but you know a lot of women talk about the fact that if if a woman makes a move with a man the audience and the editors will always decide that the man's made the decision and the right. woman's going along with it. If a woman wins Survivor, a, very, a lot of the time it's the story is about how the man lost. Right. And if a man wins Survivor, it's a story about what a hero he yeah, is. Yeah, so it wasn't really – I can't pinpoint anything I did. I just voted someone out with two other guys. Yeah, um, which is the game. Which is the game. <laughs> and I don't know, Just it yeah. was just the fact that – I was a woman, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, a little bit of the editing, I think, as well. You know, sure. the editing really, really dumped me in it. Um, so, yeah, it was rough. It was rough. Yeah. But as far as how I played it, I wouldn't have played it any different. I probably just wouldn't have – I just didn't know. I probably wouldn't have said a thing that I said that I, I they could edit together to make sound like something, something else. else. But I didn't – I couldn't yeah. have known that. And how, yeah. Exactly. How, how could you possibly yeah, yeah. know that? yeah. Um, so we will throw to audience questions in about five to ten minutes. So start thinking about any questions you may have for Pia. Um, I do have a lot more though, so <laughs> if, come up with your own because I will just keep going otherwise. Um, so while on Survivor, you started to lose pigment in your skin mm-hmm. and after, afterwards you were diagnosed... Vitiligo. Vitiligo, <laughs> thank you. It's an autoimmune disorder that causes patches of skin to lose pigment or colour. And the great appearance, diversity and disability activist Carly Finlay, who you mentioned earlier, she reached out to you. Mm-hmm. How did what she said help you? And I hope in this moment you remember what she said and I can help you. I do remember yeah. that she said to me, so I started to be quite vocal about um, how it was happening to me on screen and how it actually kind of made me happy that it was because I thought, well, that's cool. Like you don't often see something physically happening to someone where they don't look perfect on screen. And um, she came to me and she said we were having a conversation and she was like thank you for the, some of the stuff you're saying and then she said as one of the genetically blessed yeah you and then went on to say other things and I was like Jack blessed and I thought and something in that moment mate I just snapped in my brain because I started to get really angry because I thought holy shit I spent my whole career feeling less than because of the negative um you know just messages that you sometimes get mm. when you're a young actor from whoever and I thought, I've spent this whole time trying to fit into an industry that's demanded perfection when I haven't really realised that I am really fucking lucky that I get mm. to walk down the street and not be stared at or that people might go, you look cute today. Like all of that stuff, that's a – like I was looking at the world through a real prism of beauty privilege, which I think mm. most of us do. Mm. And for a very short period of time I did know what it felt like to just want to walk down the street and not have people stare at me if I wasn't wearing makeup. Mm. Mm. And it changed my, perspe- my perception mm. on any- everything. And it also made me annoyed at myself that I'd wasted so many years mm. staring in the mirror going, oh, I wish I could like, I wish my lips were bigger. You know, all that mm. shit. I just was like, what an idiot. And I thought I'm, I'm going to have to speak up about that because I think it's something we don't talk about enough. Yeah, absolutely. And it's such a good reframing of sort of yeah. how you're thinking about what's happening to yeah. you. Yeah. And then I thought, well, what if I – because the first thing I thought about when my – I got vitiligo was I went, my career's over. And that's not a healthy way to think because in my brain I thought, well, actresses have to be pretty, you know. Mm. Um, And then I thought, Carly and I have had lots of chats now, and I thought, well, if I was born vitiligo or alopecia or 
a birthmark on my face. I would never have thought I could be an actress. Mm. So maybe that's a conversation we need to have that we need to see more people like that on our screens mm. so that a young child who does have something like that, you know, I've got my one of my son's friends has um, got alopecia at the moment, you know, he should be able to look in the mirror and be like, this is cool. Mm. I could be an actor. I could be a yeah. model. I could be a movie star. You know? be anything. Yeah. Um, so the process of writing a book can change you. Mm. Um, I feel like a completely different person at the end of writing my latest book than who I was at the start. I had been anxious, just full of self-doubt, total imposter syndrome all over the place. Yeah. And I finished it just no longer caring about any of the stuff that I cared so much about at the start. Did writing this book change you? It did in the sense that not deeply who I am, mm. but I think it did in the sense that I, I found my confidence to be outspoken. I think there was always a fear, and it's probably my own stupidity, but there was always a fear that, you know, as a young woman, I'm like, you have to be liked, you have to be pretty, you have to be sweet. You've got to be Audrey Hepburn. You know, just mm. perfect, sweet, 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 not say anything bad. And if you look back at a lot of my interviews, I'm like, thank you so much. And all this fakery and then I, you know, get off stage and be home. I'm like, yeah, you know what? Fucking shit's me. <laughs> um, and so it gave I me like the... I like had a cigarette. I had smoke, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just felt right. But, um, but so that it's given me the... It's given me confidence in my own voice mm. to not be afraid. And to be like, mm. you know what? Like, I should be able to have an opinion and hate things and, and speak up. And I feel really ha – it's given me a lot of happiness mm. that I found this second lease on life as far as my voice goes. Mm. I mean, annoyed at myself for being an idiot half, you know, half my life. But um, the, the freedom I feel mm. and the confidence I feel to have an opinion is – it's just been amazing. Yeah, it sort of comes through at the end of the book. Thanks. It's a lovely sort of reflective moment, and we see. I mean, as the reader, we sort we sort of see you going through it too, and growing and changing. And it's 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 lovely that you sort of bring the reader along in all of that. We are going to throw to audience questions in just a moment, um, and there will be roving microphones. So all you need to do is put your hand up, and the microphone will come to you, and then you start speaking, and that's. And, and a question. You ask a question. It's amazing. <laughs> so my final question was going to be, can we be best friends and totally. go to Italian delis and eat all <laughs> we're, that we're, free we're food that wine, they give so you? Like, with you know, yeah, you're enjoying, enjoying the wine. wine. Um, but probably shouldn't have asked that. Um, <laughs> how has it been sort of navigating the reactions to the book? It's early days, I know. It's only just yeah. come out. But how are you sort of finding that? I've been, you know, I think I was prepared for anything. So I think... I felt okay because I'd sent it to my sister and my mom and a couple sure. of friends and once people were like, oh, I read it quickly, that was a good thing. Yeah. Everyone I sent to was like, I read it in two days. And I went, well, that, I think that's a good sign. I um, also read it very quickly. <laughs> I, just, I was going to try to sort of spread it and I yeah, just I couldn't. I yeah, just so and then once it came out and I started to get people messaging me positive things and then really deep positive things yeah. and lovely things and, you know, it shouldn't all be about – like if people like it, but people seem to like it. And yeah. then that gave me a lot of confidence. So yeah. it's been nice. It's lovely. And I mean, honestly, like people have threatened to kill me on the internet. So I'm like, right. <laughs> I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna do that with my memoir, surely. That's a survivor thing, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, I'm like, yeah. surely no. no one's gonna find no. where you live and gonna The come bookish kill literary you. world, we're very nice. We don't tend to <laughs> so do I that. I should be okay. <laughs> So we're, we're ready for audience questions. We're ready for you guys to have you, – you may not have read the book yet, but if there's anything you want to know about how to win Survivor, how good is it to be Josie Alabrandi, <laughs> how can you pretend to write all of Melina Marquetta's books, <laughs> that's a good one. Okay. Oh, a microphone will come to you momentarily. We can't see anything, can we? No, right, no. I'm not allowed to put my no, hand they told up. You so. weren't allowed to do this. They said it looks bad. <laughs> I can't see anything. Do, do you have a microphone, the gentleman who has a question? Oh. Harry Potter Fed Square, I was there. Oh, nice. That was a really fun event. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so okay. <laughs> that was fun, though. And I was dressed up in Slytherin. Obviously. Oh, wow. Yes, obviously. That's, that's <laughs> to be expected. I thought you were going to say, do you love Harry Potter? Because I accidentally called my um, children um, 
Lily and James because I haven't read it. <laughs> and it was like, you love Harry Potter? I'm like, what? what? It was that moment when I was like, what do you mean? And they went, Harry Potter, Lily and James. I'm like, what? Anyway, it's done now. <laughs> Ho, I, I should, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and I think we have another question at the front. Hi. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's on. Hello. Oh, hi. Hi, Pia. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I'm Sam Hill. Uh, these days there's a lot of conversation around diversity, equity and inclusion. And, of course, when Looking for Ali Brandy came up, out... You were like the, the WOG superhero <laughs> for a, a lot of girls that, that were your age. What do you reckon has changed in that time in Australia, in the industry and just, just overall in society? Have you seen a big shift? Yeah, I have in the sense that, um, you know, casting, they're, they're really honest with you in casting. So now in casting, when I, was, when I was younger, I was definitely seen as like a diverse choice. And now in casting, I'm told that I'm not, um, I don't count as diversity in a... In a um, in a casting process. So um, that's sort of weird. I think I fit in a weird, you know, middle ground. So, um, but that's not a bad thing, I don't think. I think it's, I, I just, I just, the thing that I want to remember is that I want people to remember that it was hard for mm. us because I think if you forget that stuff mm. or you forget the bullying or that you're a filthy wog mm. and all that stuff, if we forget it, and it's really nice now that Italians are celebrated, we shouldn't forget it because it's usually just, we're just moving that nonsense onto different cultural groups, Absolutely. right? So I don't, it's not bad that I'm not cast as diverse because, uh, you know, it's seen as like really diverse, probably a little bit, but it's nice to see people, every time I'm on set now, there's definitely a, a huge group of people who are from different cultural backgrounds is really represented and people getting a shot that you know wouldn't necessarily get a shot um when the casting process was really like limited so I love seeing that I do think that we could be better with beauty I think that we're being really good with being diverse, with having people from different cultures, for being really inclusive, especially with First Nations people. But I do think that a lot of our choices are still very, very beautiful. And I think it would be nice to see more diversity in, in mm. that respect. Just that classical definition of beauty. Yeah, yeah, just that classical, you know, if we look at all our exports, um, if we look at people who are working a lot, we don't see a lot of vis visual differences and so that, for me, would be just something mm. that I think could be a positive change. But as far as the change in the industry, it's been pretty nice to mm. see. I love, like, turning on a show and just seeing people from all different backgrounds. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. I just did, um, yeah, a film with a lot of different cultural backgrounds in it. It was really – it's just really fun. Yeah, that's great. I think we have some more questions at the front. Hey, PR. Hi. How are you going? Good, how are you? Good, good. You look amazing. Thank um, you. I really went there tonight. I've been wearing jeans and T-shirts yeah, to all my no, events, so you got the good night. <laughs> no, I, just, I can't wait to read the book. Thank um, you. I just want, I've been fortunate enough to chat to you on the gram, and I just wanted to say... Oh, like, on the gram? On the gram. Did you slide like, into my DMs? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> what did we talk about? No, no, just uh, some survi Survivor Super Nerds. Oh, yeah, um, fair. No, I will always chat to Survivor good. Super Nerds. Yeah. I, just, I guess a comment and a question, I, I just hope you know, like, years later, as Survivor Super fans, like, you are arguably the best Australian winner. Like, yes! you're just brilliant. Woo! Thank you. I actually, I, I watch your final tribal on a regular basis. Thank I watched you. it last night. And can you spread the word? I, I was never going home at final no, five. You're I was never going home at final no, no. five. I, it's interesting because I liken your tribal to uh, Todd from China. Oh, thank you. And my favourite winner, Parvati. Parvati, um, of course, yes. And I, would, I love what you mentioned because I know a lot of it's disgusting how women are treated on Survivor mm -hmm. in the sense that Parvati has come out and said, you know, she distanced herself from Survivor for like 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Just for making moves, mm -hmm. um, because she was a woman, she was treated pre pretty terribly. So yeah. I just hope you know, like, how loved in the Survivor community you Thank are. Thank you so much. That means you're just so much the to greatest. me. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I could cry. And your win was just. <laughs> how much oh my God. I am. Your win was amazing. I never get sick of watching it. Thank you. Um, did you did you get asked to come back for All Stars or Heroes versus Villains? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just, um, I think that's my game. I think my game is like, what's happening? And then. You know, I think I, I just – that's the game I wanted to play and I I don't feel like – I don't know if anyone's going to fall – like, honestly, fall for my shit twice. <laughs> and 
I also love the game of Survivor so much that I wouldn't want to go and take someone's place if I wasn't really hungry to win. Mm. And I'm not sure that I could sit next to someone in a final tribal and take it away from them. So I just mm. think there's no point. Plus, I get to go to my grave with my torch unsnuffed. Yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> I say it with affection. I hope on um, if there's a fans versus favourites and I, I vote you out, don't take it personally. You're I too love much, it. You're too much of a threat. So I love it. Love. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so you. much. That was really lovely. Thank Survivor you. Survivor is so ruthless. <laughs> Oh God. See how nice we are to each other? Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm voting you out and, yeah, it's quite intense. We do have time for one more question. And I... Hi, I Tia. My Hi. name's Ida. I'm um, in my 50s as well. And I guess I just wanted to let you know that I saw um, Lucky Fowler Brandy a few years ago when it first came out. And my daughter, who's with me has seen it as well. So you have actually stemmed through two generations. Oh, that's there. nice. So she actually invited us to come here tonight and it's been wonderful. Oh, so thank we'd you. like to just wish you all the best. And thank you. It has been great to have it go through the generations. So that's nice. Exactly. Yeah, I'm waiting for my daughter to watch it. Oh, she'll love it. I hope so. <laughs> i got to fast forward yeah. the sex scene though. Well, <laughs> She's going to learn some bad yeah, stuff. Yeah, right. and, um, some just... Just one question. I'm assuming yeah. Anthony Lapalia is still one of your favourite. Yeah, he's. Yeah. You know, he's playing yeah. down the road. I know. I in know. Death of Death I saw him the other night after the show, and, I, and he was st he was standing outside, and I was like, "Dad," <laughs> and he's like, "Daughter." And people were just like, "This is weird." <laughs> he's yeah, amazing. It no, it was lovely. We, we've both enjoyed it. Yeah, uh, he's wonderful. So we do have time for one more question, if there is one more. Otherwise, I will I'll wrap us up. And Hello. Hello. Hi. I am one of many girls in the audience who see myself in you. I went to the movie with my mum, my nonna, my cousin, everything. I'm actually a mother now, and I was really keen to understand what you are doing with your children, who I'm assuming a third-generation Italian, just mm -hmm. like me, um, what you want them to carry on and what you hope that they'll see in this book and in your body of work as well? Um, I think as far as being like they're very Italian-Australian, so I definitely keep the Italian side of um, us alive and my, my daughter loves being a little bit Italian. She just thinks it's really amazing and exotic. So, you know... Um, I definitely would, like, I'd love to take them back to Italy. Um, then they're also, they're half Irish. Well, my f husband's family's Irish. There's a lot of Irish blood in my mum's side of the family, so they really want to go to Ireland as well. I think just in general, I like to just remind them of where they come from and because I think history and tradition just can make you, it can sort of enrich you and give you confidence and make you proud. Um, and they eat a lot of Italian food, so that's all I can cook. <laughs> I can't cook a stir fry for shit. Um, and... As far as my work, they're somewhat disinterested, which I hope is a sign of good parenting. I mean, I, I, you know, I sort of try and treat my job – like my daughter's 13 now, so sometimes she finds it funny that her friends find it funny if I'm on TV. But they don't really watch stuff I do. Like I was on Dancing with the Stars and they chose to watch reruns of Gumball instead. <laughs> do you want to see Mummy's Tango? And they're like, mm. um, <laughs> So I guess I like that in the sense that I like them just to look at it as a job. So it's just mm. something mum's doing for work and it's definitely not a priority or a big part of who we are. Oh, that's such a good answer. And I think that, um, I mean, I'm going to wrap it up, but I think that, you know, being Italian and ca and being Italian in Melbourne, I think mm -hmm. is there's lots of ways to carry on the tradition. just go to La Mana. Exactly. You've got like cousins go working Mana, there. Like, like yeah. on streets, a good yeah, spot. Yeah, it's so good. Um, My sister and I meet at La Mana and we're like shh, vibrating, we get so excited. <laughs> Like, do you want to go to Mana? Do you? Yeah. And then the kids come. But Mana is a very special place. It's like, so special. It's the cleaning product yeah, that yeah. no one else understands. It's got all the bleach in yeah, everything. It's so There's a good. lot of bleach yeah. in all of those Italian cleaning mm -hmm. products. And that smell is so, so evocative. Um, you talked about Mr. Sheen, but I, I like a bit of varicina, which oh, is bleach, you know. Yeah, all the flavours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that smell. <laughs> the lemon. The lemon with it to, like, act like it's not bleach. I know. Like or the lavender is like, oh, it's calming, but it's also getting, like, don't be very toxic. with your skin because it will peel it off. Um, 
Huge thanks to you, Pia Thank Miranda, you so much. For, for so many things, but for, for embodying a character that does mean so much Thank to so you. many, myself included. That is a huge weight to carry and I do want to acknowledge that. Um, and I'm always excited to see what you're going to do next. I did not see the Survivor thing coming, <laughs> I've got to say. Um, and I'm not in the world enough to sort of really have appreciated the moment until I read the book. Mm -hmm. And that section I loved. I really I felt that competitive fire. And I was right there with you. Thank it was amazing. You. I want to thank the Wheeler Centre for organising this wonderful event. We're so lucky in Melbourne to get to have events like this around books and culture and art and ideas. Copies of this brilliant book, Finding My Bella Vita, are available to purchase through Readings. Thank you, Readings. And Pia will be signing at the back of the room. Finally, I want to thank you all for coming out, late night chats. And that's it. Thank, thank you. you. Yay. <laughs>